that we face many challenges, but uh, praise God for his mercy. And the thing that uh, we're going to center on a little as we get into this a little ways is the unchanging nature of the Lord God. It's a bedrock of our faith. The promises that the Lord has made to us is predicated in one way on the fact that he does not change. So when he makes promises, he's going to keep his word. And uh, we'll, we'll see that today, but we've got to take a little bit of a journey to get there in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. So in 1672, John Bunyan, remember John Bunyan, he's, he's the author of Pilgrim's Progress, classic book. They say, other than the Bible, the highest selling book in history Pilgrim's Progress, other than the Bible. The Bible's the, most, the highest selling book ever written. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> but John Bunyan. So John Bunyan spent time in prison. He was, a, he was a pastor there in Britain, but he wasn't part of the established church. And uh, he spent time in prison for preaching the Word of God. Primarily, justification by faith was the dispute. And they told him, uh, if you stop preaching, we'll let you go. And he wrote about that in his diaries. He, he, said, uh, uh, he said, it grieves me. In that day, if you're in a, in a prison in Great Britain, if you're going to eat, your family's going to bring you your food. Things like that. It's not, there weren't meals supplied. And so he would see his wife, and he had a young daughter who was blind, totally blind. And he said, it just breaks my heart. Every time they come, when she leaves, I want to be there for them. And his family was destitute because he wasn't out there working and providing. And they're scraping by to supply his needs in prison. And, he, and all you have to do is stop preaching. And he said, I can't do it. I have a commission from the Lord God to preach his word and to preach the gospel as I understand it. And so he refused it. He was in prison for 12 years the first time. And finally, uh, kings changed and laws changed and he was released preached for a few more years and then another topping of the government and he was back in prison for a shorter stay where he wrote Pilgrim's Progress when he was in prison. Very interesting story, but the idea that obedience can be very hard to do. We know often what we should do. We know often what the Lord wants us to do, but there's the doing of it and there's a price to be paid sometimes for obeying the Lord God. And for John Bunyan, it was the commission he felt he had from the Lord to preach his word. So today, when we look at, uh, in 1 Samuel, I want to give a little bit of background here, because it's a very uh, interesting story. Uh, but Saul is going to uh, have... A very difficult task giving, given to him, and he's going to obey to a point, but then he's not. And we're going to see that and some of the consequences uh, of that. And so, in, uh, back in, we're not, we don't have to go there and look at it, but in uh, chapter uh, 8 of 1 Samuel, um, excuse me, chapter 12, Sam, uh, 1 Samuel, Saul is installed as king. He's now the king. Back in chapter 8, Samuel is getting old. And uh, it's, there's a transition coming. Samuel's going to be moving off the scene. He has two sons that are active. And the people come to him, the leaders, and they say, your sons aren't like you. We don't want them judging us. Give us a king. And Samuel says, but God is your king. No, we'll be like the other nations. Give us a king. And so Samuel goes to the Lord and he grieves because God's their king. And the Lord tells him, go back to them and give them a king. Warn them about the king's procedure, but give them a king. They haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And so that leads to Samuel, under God's direction, anointing Saul king over Israel. And there's an interesting story about how that happened. But Saul is the king, but he's the king because the people have rejected the Lord God as their king. Well, so he's installed there in chapter 12. Well, then it's war. 
Saul is king. He wants to establish the kingdom. And so you look here in chapter 14, verse 47, it says, Now when Saul had taken uh, the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, the sons of Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobah, the Philistines, and wherever he had turned, he inflicted punishment. So it's war on every side. And he's establishing the kingdom, uh, creating security for the nation, and he's fighting on every side. Then you get to chapter 15, and now God is going to speak into the situation. Saul is a king. You remember, back up a little further, when they were going into the land, the Lord had told them, when you go in there, you push out the people that live there, destroy those who stay, and the land is yours, and I will fight for you. And so they had this direction, and there's war on every side. Now in chapter 15, verse 1. Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as he go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Wow. Hard stuff to hear and to read that at the command of the Lord, you go do this. Now it's very interesting. People wrestle with this with this text. Matter of fact, I have on my shelf at home a book, Does God, Did God Really Command Genocide? Did God Really Command Genocide? Because people struggle with this text along with others. And I think, in my mind, it's the wrong question because God is before the question. There is not a standard of good that somehow is back here, and okay, God, here's the good, conform to it. It's the other way around. God is furthest back. Good flows out of the being and nature of God. And so if the Lord God says, go and annihilate this race, it's for good reasons, even if it's hard to hear and if we don't understand it. Good is part of the flows out of the being and nature of God. He sets the standard. He is the standard, predicated on his unchanging nature. It does not change, and we'll see that here. And so what's, what's going on here? Well, if we go back uh, in history, when the children of Israel were on their way through the desert, Amalek attacked Israel. You remember the story. Amalek attacks Israel. And Moses says to uh, Joshua, tomorrow you take the men and you go out and fight Amalek. I'm going up on the hill to intercede with God. As long as Moses held up the staff of God, the people triumphed. When the staff fell, Amalek triumphed. Aaron and Hur sat him down on a rock, stood on each side, held his arms above his head till sundown, and a tremendous victory was won that day. Incredible story. When that was done... Exodus 17, verse 14 to 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn, The Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. The Lord is my banner. Banner, Yahweh Nisi. Yahweh is the banner we march under. And the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now fast forward another 
35-ish years. Second giving of the law, Deuteronomy. Moses is, is probably within days or weeks of when he's going to die and he's giving the people the final words from God as far as through him. And in Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19, remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out from Egypt, how he met you along the way and attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. When we wrestle with this text, we need to remember that way back there during the Exodus, God says, I'm going to deal with Amalek. And now with Saul, judgment day has come. When we wrestle with these texts, think about it. What, I think what we struggle with here primarily is the Lord God sent men to go kill man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. If we think clearly, remember the flood. During the flood, the Lord God killed everybody except for eight people. He didn't say wipe out Amalek or a certain race. He killed everybody except for eight people. And we, we struggle with that less than we do this, probably because here he's using men. In fact, with the flood, we take the ark, which is a symbol of annihilation, and we make toys out of it. If you think about it, very interesting. The Lord God is sovereign over life and death. That's the point. If you go back in, uh, in uh, 1 Samuel here to chapter 2, you remember when Samuel was uh, born, his mother, Hannah, she had prayed to the Lord. She was barren. She wanted a child. And she had prayed and she weeps and the Lord hears her prayer and she promised, if you give me a son, I'll give him right back to you to serve you for his whole life. And so when she weans Samuel, she brings him to the tabernacle to, to serve with Eli there at the tabernacle. And in chapter 2, Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. And she exalts the virtues of the living God. Because she's just so overwhelmed. And yet even Hannah... In her song, verse 6, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. And even Hannah, in her song of rejoicing over what God has done, makes mention of the fact that the Lord God is sovereign over life and death. Remember Balaam? Kind of a would-be prophet. Balak, the king of Moab. Go get Balaam, have him come and curse Israel. Every time he tries to curse Israel, he ends up blessing Israel. Utter failure. <laughs> Even Balak makes mention of the fact in Numbers 23, last half of the verse, he says, Alas, who can live except God has ordained it? Who can live except God has ordained it? And then Deuteronomy 32, 39, See now that I... I am he, and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. There is no one who can deliver from my hand. The Lord God is sovereign over life and death. And like we said earlier, if he commands the annihilation of Amalek, it's for good reasons. Now, when governments try to do this kind of thing today, because we've seen it in our world, it's even going on now where certain races have been targeted and, uh, to be annihilated. When they do that, they're just plain evil. Only God commands life and death. That's the point. We notice here in our, in our chapter now, in verse 4, that uh, Saul moves quickly to obey. 
He said, uh, uh, verse 4, Saul summoned the people, numbered them into lame, 200,000 foot soldiers and the 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Here's how I think it went. This is, this is my interpretation. Samuel came to Saul. And they're, they're standing there and Samuel's explaining to Saul God's instructions. I think as soon as he was done, the captain of Saul's army is standing right over here waiting for what the king wants. As soon as Samuel's done, he turned to him and he said, make it so, gather the men in Tulane, gave them a time period, three days, three weeks, whatever, and we're going to go do it. I don't think there was any hesitation. God gave him an order and he was going to go take, uh, f- fulfill that order. And it, so they moved quickly. Except, verse 8, he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So let me reread verse 3 and see if you can find the exception clause. Go and strike Amalek, utterly destroy all he has, do not spare him, put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Where is the exception clause for Agag in God's command? It's not there. There's something else going on here. It can be very hard at times to obey all the way. It's like the struggle that John Bunyan had that he, he, he followed through and he did what the Lord had given him to do, but it was, it was grievous for him in many ways. Saul, there's something going on here with Saul because he stops short. And we're going to see here now that partial obedience is complete disobedience. And that's what we're going to see here. Starting in uh, verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly dis- destroyed. Stop there a minute. The best of the sheep, oxlings, and fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good... They were not willing to destroy utterly, but everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. According to whose standard? Hadn't God said, utterly destroy? They're making value judgments, and, and they're not willing to destroy the best of the oxen, the fatlings, and the lamb, and all that was good. According to whose standard? God had said, destroy. The people said, well, this is... Um, this is rationalization. Well, this is a, this is a good sheep. It's no blemishes. That's a, that would be a good sacrifice. But God had said, destroy it. And you see the people are rationalizing and saying, well, but it's a good sacrifice. Certainly God didn't mean that, but God said, destroy it. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and not, has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak. Samuel said, is it not true that though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? You see the rationalizing of, well, this is a good sacrifice. There's something else going on here. You notice in verse 12, there were, when Saul is first uh, confronted, uh, excuse me, in verse 13, Samuel came to Saul and said to him, 
And Saul said to him, Blessed are you, the Lord. I've carried out the command of the issue of, of, the, of the Lord. And he said, Oh, really? Why am I hearing sheep? And then Saul tries to brush it off on the people. He says there in verse 15, They, they have brought him. For the people spared the best of the sheep. Well, but who's king, Saul? Not, not the people. Who did God give the commandment to, Saul? You, the king, not the people. There's something else going on here. What's really going on here? You see these Asian kings? One of the symbols of their power were all the defeated kings that are eating at their table. Saul keeps Agag alive, and it's a sign to every other king in the area these defeated kings that, eat at, that uh, eat at my table, you want some? I got some for you too. Oh, and that monument, the monument there, uh, up in uh, verse 12, Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Saul, uh, Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. What's he doing? It's a symbol of his greatness and of his power. He's trying to establish his kingdom according to his own methods. Think of it. When Israel crossed the Jordan River, love that story, and the priests are carrying the Ark of God, as soon as their feet hit the water, the river stops, and, it, and, the, and, the, and it's dry, and they march across to lay siege to Jericho, which we know that siege was just marching, right? But they, they do that, and when they get to the other side, Samuel sends, or Samuel, Joshua sends uh, 12 men back out in the river to, to grab stones and they all come back with big stones and what do they do? They build a monument. Ebenezer. And when you pass this way with your children and they say, what do these stones mean? You tell them what God did here. Saul, he's building monuments to himself. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. Look at obedience over rationalization would be what the Lord would have for us. Verse 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice to, to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The, the keeping of the law in the burnt offerings as God has commanded, that's all great and wonderful, Saul. But obeying the voice of the Lord, it's not the ritual, it's the heart. And it's the heart of the sacrificer, not the sacrifice. It's always been about that. It's where the faith is placed. And to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of ram. Rebellion is as a sin of divination, divination, comporting with demons. It's as if you have a demon, Saul. Insubordination is iniquity and idolatry. And you have rejected the word of the Lord because you've rejected the word of the Lord. He's rejected you as king. Remember the people. They rejected the Lord. Give us a king. But God is your king. No, give us a king. We'll be like the other, country, other nations. They reject the Lord. Now their king has rejected the Lord. And the Lord is rejecting their king. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. One other thing that we should look at here. Look at verse 24. And Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As the Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has give it, given it to your neighbor who is better than you. You see, even in his repentance, 
It's not so much that Saul is repentant than that he's busted. He's been, he's, he's being confronted and now he has regret. Not so much repentance as he has regret. And now he's concerned about appearances. So when I go back, Samuel, you come back with me so that everybody will know that I'm okay. And Samuel sees through that and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Ultimately, he did go back with Saul. And I think the reason why he did that is if Saul falls today, the nation likely would fall with him. And so Samuel goes back with him ultimately. But Saul has been rejected for, rejected, for rejecting God and there's no recourse uh, for him for repentance. It's merely regret that he has. And the Lord removes the kingdom from him. Now we know that it's going to take a while for all of that to happen. But it's very interesting here as the account goes on. Let's look at a little more of this because we want to see where the security uh, for Israel and ultimately security for us is. The Lord, uh, verse 28, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. This uh, title for God here, glory of Israel. I believe that's the only place in our scripture where that title for God is used. The glory of Israel. And he will not change, he will not lie or change his mind. Well, we go down a little further in verse 32. Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Gruesome. Hard to hear even, but God had given Saul a command. And Samuel finished the job that Saul failed to do. Saul went to Ramah, but Samuel went to Ramah, but Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. For Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. It's very interesting here. So in verse 29, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should not, or that he should change his mind. The the glory of Israel doesn't change his mind, he doesn't change. But then in verse 35, and also back there in verse 11, uh, he says, I regret that I have made Saul king. Now, what's going on there? Now, if you're like me, you've had a lot of regrets in life. And usually when you regret something, isn't it along the line of, boy, if I had to do that over again, I'd do it different. You know, like if I had to appoint a king, I'd appoint somebody other than Saul so that this wouldn't happen. Do we really think that's what God thinks or how God functions? The glory of Israel does not change. He is not a man that he should change his mind. So what's going on here? There's a $10 word the uh, theologians use that I want to throw out there, but then we'll, we'll talk about it. Anthropopathic speech. So what in the world is that? Anthropos. Anthropos, man. Pathos, feelings. Anthropos, man, pathos, feeling, man feelings, human feelings. When we see things like Saul regretted that he made, or the Lord regretted that he made Saul king over Israel, when we see that, what the, what the writer is trying to do is to communicate the fact that there's a, there's a significant change in your relationship with God and it's a result of your sin. Remember, God doesn't change. But from our perspective, as we look at God, because the blessing isn't there anymore, it looks like God changed. He hasn't changed. We have. And so it's it's assigning human feelings to God. So if we think about this, I have a little grandson, 
Steve, we take care of him a couple days a week, and what is he now? He's three and a half. Love that little boy. You know, but you get down on your knees, you know, with a little kid like that, and you, especially as they're young, and you, you tend to talk baby talk and do stuff that you really wouldn't do with other adults around, you know, and things like that. But you're trying to communicate on a child's level. That's what God's doing in the book. This is the omnipotent God of the universe, and he's trying to communicate with us. And so when he does, he gets down on his knees, and he talks to us in words we can understand. When, God, when it says that God regrets, it's trying to express that something's changed in our relationship, and it's you. This word is used in the Old Testament in one other place. And again, it's in the context of judgment. And it's Genesis 6, verse 7. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. That word sorry, NIV 84 translates that as grieved. NIV 2011 translates that as regret. It's the same underlying word there. And it's the same thing. What's changed in our relationship? God hasn't changed. We have. And he's trying to communicate the change in relationship that has happened. Remember, we're made in God's image. So we're image bearers, but we're far less than he is. So he has to condescend. He has to stoop down to talk to us. We will never be on God's level. It's always condescension for God to communicate with us, but he loves us. It's one theologian who says, those who predicate any change whatsoever of God, whether respect to his essence, knowledge, or will, diminish all his attributes. God doesn't change. We need to uh, think about some application of this, some of what we've learned here from this uh, account of Saul and his disobedience, his nine-tenths of the law, went and annihilated everything except the best of the sheep and the oxen and kept Agag alive. If we look carefully at ourselves, we find that we're real good often with our nine-tenths of the law. It's the hard stuff. When life hits us fast. When uh, sinful lifestyles and other things are introduced into our lives through family members and others and we don't know how to respond in love and yet still honor the Lord God in that. And we cry out for wisdom. And yet remembering that God has said what a man is, what a woman is. The text is clear on that. That's a big one in our culture. And the text is clear on that. And it's one we can't bend on. We can probably do better at loving. But we're real good sometimes at obeying our nine-tenths of the law and thinking that that's enough, and yet total, partial obedience is total disobedience. Well, here's some things to think about. One uh, that we made there in 15, verse 3, God is sovereign over life and death. Psalm 139, you remember David, uh, in that psalm, he talks about the fact that the wonders that you knew me but when I was formed in the inward places and you saw me. And he says in there, in your book, were written all the days ordained for me. This is 139 verse 16. In your book were written all the days ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. God has ordained your days. We should take tremendous comfort when we say God is sovereign over life and death. We should take great comfort in that. It should cause us to live uh, somewhat seriously and yet at the same time to find joy in life and to to enjoy our life knowing that there's a day assigned when the Lord's going to say to me come up here absent from the body present with the Lord 
To live is Christ, to die is gain. It's predicated on the fact that God doesn't change. And he's sovereign over life and death. And praise God for it. It's not willy-nilly happenstance. Those unexplainable, hard to accept deaths that come. God has his good purposes at work for his glory. And we need to trust that and believe it. It's an it's a, it's a, a object of our faith. It's a test of our faith. Number two, God commands our obedience. Chapter 15, verse 23, the first half of the, of the verse, rebellion is as a sin of divination and insubordination is as an iniquity and idolatry. God commands our obedience. Let's go over for just a minute, just a minute, over to John chapter 14, just a couple of verses that I want us to look at there. I was going to mention this ahead of time so you could be there already, but John chapter 14 Verse 15, this is Jesus. Do you mean I'm still under the law? (laughs) This is Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, that's stated very positively. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Let's, Let's state that negatively. If you don't love me, you will not keep my commandments. It's very simple. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You go a little farther in uh, chapter 14, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Then you go to verse 17. This I command you, that you love one another. That's in chapter 15, I'm sorry. 15, four, uh, 12 and 15, 17. This is my commandment that you love one another. What's one of Jesus' commandments? Love one another. It's not an option. We're commanded to obey and to love one another. The one, uh, uh, the guy that I read just, just this last week, his uh, name is Dallas Willard. He's with Dallas Willard. He's with the Lord now. But... Uh, He said, the law is not the source of righteousness. Law keeping is not the source of righteousness, but it is always the way of the righteous. Law keeping is not the source of righteousness, but it's always the way of the righteous. In other words, righteous before God, we try to practice the commands of God and to do what he he tells us to do. It's that simple. God commands our obedience. Thank God for his grace in Jesus Christ. Because I don't do that all the time, as much as we may want to. So there's forgiveness there. The commandment still remains. So now number three, this is the the big principle to tie it all together. The unchanging nature of the Lord our God is a bedrock truth of our hope in Christ. Bedrock. Theologians call this Immutability, not mutable, not changeable. Constancy is a word that a lot of the theologians will use, but it speaks to the fact that God is. Remember that name, Yahweh, that the Lord gave to Moses at the burning bush when he said, who do I tell him sent me? You tell him, I am sent you. I am. God is. And so God is. God doesn't become. God is. So God is, he does not change. He doesn't change in his being or nature. There in chapter 15, verse 29, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind. He is not a man that he should change his mind. Later, several hundred years, you get to Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6. And when you get to the point of Malachi, there's going to be 400 and some silent years, no revelation until John the Baptist comes on the scene. And so right near the end of God speaking under the, uh, uh, the Old Covenant, Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. You, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed because I don't change. 
Now think about it. Go all the way back to Genesis 12. Abraham, you follow me. I'll make of you a great nation. And you read those several chapters up to about chapter 20. Abraham and his family and all that the Lord God does and he takes him outside. Look up at the stars. and You see your, your lineage exceeds even that. Can you count the stars? No, you won't even be able to count all of your descendants. Oh, and there's going to be a chosen one through your line who's going to come. That's our Lord. And God promised these things. And so he says, the reason Jacob, sons of Jacob, Israel, the reason you're not changed is because I made a promise and I don't change. For us, when the text says there is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can take that as the truth because God does not change. You and I can babble into the air, at least I can and say things, and then it doesn't come to pass or whatever. When God speaks, it's absolute, it's final, and it's done. And we can take him at his word because he does not change. It's why in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, Paul could say, faithful is he who calls you, and he will also bring it to pass. Praise God that we worship a living God and he doesn't change.